And good morning, I'm Dr. Ara Dukmajan. It is April 18, 2023. We're broadcasting spine surgery being performed live here at the Duke Spine Institute, Surgery Center Vieira. Our patient comes to us from Tampa, Florida. He's a local. Um, we're over in Melbourne, the opposite side of the coast of Florida near SpaceX, which is getting ready to launch for the first time in history. It's heavy rocket. They've delayed it a few times but it's literally around the corner. So if it goes up during this broadcast, you're definitely gonna feel it and hear it. <laughs> anyway, our patient presents to us with a two year history, two years of agonizing neck pain. And he originally injured his neck 10 years ago in an accident, car accident. Now, 10 years ago, he had some pain, but it was intermittent. And in the last two years, the pain's gotten a lot worse. More recently, it's become constant, unbearable. His pain is localized to the C5, 6, C6, 7 discs on exam. It is discogenic pain. You can see on the MRI, he's got annular tear with disc bulging at C5, 6, C6, 7. So we talked to him about treatment. The only treatment that works for painful discs today is surgery on the disc. There's a few types of surgery that can be done. One of them is a fusion. If he had had a fusion, he would have a long incision and he would have a lot of trouble swallowing, scar tissue, vocal cord damage, nerve damage, and the complication rate for cervical fusions, which is the most common surgery recommended, is 50%. That means 50% of patients having an ACDF, which is an anterior cervical discectomy infusion or decompression infusion, is 50%. The complication rate for the surgery you're gonna see today, the Duke Laser Disc Repair, is 0%. In 16 years, we've had zero complications for the cervical Duke Laser Disc Repair, zero. So the Duke laser disc repair is much safer than an ACDF, zero complication versus 50%. And the Duke laser disc repair, the patients have zero narcotics. There's no need for painkillers after surgery. With ACDF, they're gonna take lots of narcotics afterwards for pain, usually for six weeks to three months. So Duke laser disc repair is safer and a better surgery. All right, we're gonna get started. The first thing we're gonna do is uh, localize. Just so you know, his eyes are here, ojos, his mouth here, chin here, chest is here. This is the middle of his neck going from his chin down. We're on the right side, which is the correct side. And to get to the spine, you first have to place a needle. And this is an 18 gauge spinal needle. I'm showing you my technique because number one, I want people to learn this new technology on how to fix herniated bulging discs in the neck. But also I want surgeons to learn they don't have to do fusions anymore because this is a much safer and better treatment. All right, two fingers, feel the spine. You must have a patient who is asleep, chemically paralyzed. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. We're gonna start at six, seven. I'm a little bit lower than I wanna be, but I'm happy. Shot, you can see the needle. All right, let's go with a uh, AP view. I want the tip of the needle on the front back or AP view to be in the midline. So I'm going to check the AP view. When you're doing this kind of surgery, you must check multiple views. There it is, it's in the midline, perfect. So I'm gonna stop and show you a few more things on the anatomy in a moment, but right now, I've got a job to do. I've got to get this tip of this needle through the skin and into the spine at C6, 7. Shot? All right, there it is. So two, three, four, five, six, seven. Everyone agree? Let's get an AP, make sure we're in the middle. I'm right up against the spine now. I could feel it with the tip of the needle. Quick AP, don't roll everything, just get a quick shot. Lateral, there it is, perfect. So I'm in the midline and I'm gonna enter the annulus. 
people ask me all the time, when you do that, do you damage the, the front of the disc? And the answer is no. All right, I'm hitting a little calcium spike there. I'm going to try to get above it. Shot? I need a little bit better pull. Shot? I'm going to turn my needle so I'm aiming downward. Shot? You guys see that? Shot? Shot? All right, yeah, I'm hitting that little calcium spike again. Shot? I'm trying to get right above it. There it is. Shot? All right, so I'm in. Just barely. And let's get an AP. There we are. AP, uh, quickly, poker. So you have to use lateral views and AP views to do the surgery. Thank you, everybody. All right, perfect. Show us the tip of the needle. Show us the spinous process. There's the tip of the needle. There's the spinous process, the one above. There it is. So you can see we're right in the midline. You want to be about a centimeter, 10 millimeters, left or right of the midline when you enter the the annulus. The reason is if you go too far to the side, you're going to get into the longest coli muscle and you can damage the longest coli muscle. More importantly, you can damage the sympathetic trunk, which is located inside the longest coli muscle. If you do that, your patient will have a Horner syndrome. Sean, let's go with a, a discogram. So this discogram is different than the, the lumbar and thoracic, which we have the patient awake, and they tell us about their pain. Shot. Let's just see the position of the needle. It's very good. We're looking for a tear in the back of the disc. I feel it. Shot. All right, let's pull the shoulders. Let's get a good shot. Shot. Don't overexpose me, please, Jordan. Shot. All right. Well, it's a bit overexposed, but you can actually see the tear in the back of the disc and the herniation. Show them both. Unfortunately, it's not a great picture, but there's the tear right there. Yes, and then show us the herniation. Yep, that's it. It's a big herniation. So it's a lot bigger than it appeared on the MRI. And of course, we are now at two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's run the video showing our audience how does a herniated disc actually cause neck pain? Okay, can we do that? Traumatic injury on the disc can cause annular tears to form. Pressure on the disc causes herniation of the nucleus pulpus through the annular tear. Inflammatory tissue develops within the annular tear causing neck pain. The inflamed annular tear generates pain signals. Additional injuries can cause worsening symptoms. Inflammation from the annular tear can spread to the nearby nerve roots, causing arm pain. Pain signals travel up the nerves to the brain causing localized neck pain. Pain signals reach the primary somatosensory cortex causing conscious awareness of neck pain. If you have a herniated or bulging disc in neck pain, submit your MRI for a free review at www.mri.dukespine.com. All right, welcome back. Now you understand why discs can be painful. It's inflammation within the tear of the annulus in the back of the disc only. We're about to make our incision. We use a number 11 blade. I've already put some numbing medicine. Can you see this okay, Henry? Yes, we can. I'm going to make a four millimeter incision just starting with the tip right at where the needle enters the skin. There it is. The whole surgery, folks, will be done through this four millimeter incision. Okay. Everything in neurosurgery is moving towards less invasive, smaller incisions, but more important than a small incision is less damage underneath the incision. Shot. 
so less damage inside your body. The skin incision is one thing. It's nice to have a small incision. But what really matters, Luis, I need help, is, is that we don't, uh, you're pulling the whole body that way. You need to pull on both shoulders, okay? The most important thing is that we don't do damage inside the body. All right, does everybody understand that? So basically my goal, Sean, is to fix this disc properly without doing damage underneath the skin. And the problem is fusion surgery shot, it does a lot of damage under the skin. All right, you can see the tip of the dilator, it's coming down, show us the tip of the dilator passing through the soft tissues, show us the endotracheal tube, show, no, that's the esophageal, there's the endotracheal tube, show us the esophageal temperature probe, yep. Now show us the tip of the guide wire and shot. Show us the tip of the dilator at the front of the spine. There you go, perfect. Let's get an AP view. Relax on the shoulders, everybody. By the way, it's bloodless surgery. We've lost really two, maybe two drops of blood at this point, maybe. I don't even think we've lost that. About a drop and a half. A drop of blood, you need 20 drops of blood to make a milliliter. All right, perfect. You can see the tip of the dilator is virtually in the center of the spine. We're a little bit off to the right, and that's fine. You can see most of the dye that we had put in there is gone at this point. The, it's been absorbed or taken away by the bloodstream. It'll end up in the, in the urine. Any dye that we put in goes to the urine, to the kidneys, it's filtered out. Kind of like a pool filter. You all know what a pool filter is. Filters out debris, leaves, stuff like that, detritus. All right, well your kidneys filter out everything from your body. I need a mallet. We're gonna enter the annulus. People ask me, when you do that, Dr. Duke, doesn't that cause damage to the disc? The answer is no, it doesn't. Because the center of this disc that I'm passing through is a jelly, it's like a jelly center. It's not jelly like a jelly donut, but it's a, it's a firm jelly, okay? And that's perfect. So the center of the disc we're passing through is like if you were to jump into a pool on a hot summer day, do you see when you jump through the water, does the water open and then stay open damaged or does it close back around you? That's what the jelly does in the center of the disc. A disc it closes back around the tube. And when we come out with the tube, it's going to close back. So we're literally just spreading it apart temporarily to do the surgery. And then let me give me a second. And then it's going to come back together. So we're not damaging the disc at all. Can you guys see the tube? We're doing the entire surgery through this tube. Yes, we can. Okay. This tube is uh, a four millimeter diameter tube. Take a look right here. Four millimeters. You see the diameter there? It's not even four millimeters. It's about four millimeters right there. 3.8 millimeters. The entire two discs that normally would require a big incision, lots of damage inside to the soft tissues, scarring, bleeding, none of that's going to happen. We're literally going to use this tiny four millimeter tube. Doctor. I've tried bringing this technology to the neurosurgeons of the world. And the problem is, is that number one, it's really hard to learn how to do. So it takes a long time of training, which there's no training available currently except at Duke Spine here in Florida. And the second problem is these surgeries don't pay the surgeons as much as the fusions and artificial discs do. Artificial discs pay the surgeons a lot of money. And that's why they like to do artificial discs and fusions. Surgeons make millions of dollars doing those surgeries and they're not gonna make nearly as much doing this. So that's why they're not offering it to you folks. But the reality is this is a much safer and better surgery than a fusion is. I'm gonna pull the dilator back just the slightest amount. Shot. I'm, my dilator is at the back of the disc and I don't want it going any further. Shot, so I'm gonna bring it back 
just a little bit while we do this, just to make sure that we don't push it forward. I'm having a hard time twisting it out. You giving me some neck distraction? That should, that should be it there. Sean, yeah, all right. So I move the dilator back just so I can keep an eye on it. I don't want it advancing into the spinal cord. Sean, we just have to be careful to keep an eye on it. That's nice, Sean. All right, so now I have to advance the dilator to the back of the disc, Sean. Can you all see that? I know it's hard, it's a little too dark, Jordan. We need to brighten that part up. You need to move the whole fluoro south, and you're too far north. That's why you have a difficult with what you're trying to do because your upper spine is overexposed and the shoulder spine is underexposed. All right, just about there. Now we're at the back of the disc, okay? This is where the herniation is. This is what we've come to fix. So I'm gonna take the dilator out. I'm gonna take, uh, leave the tube. So this is a four millimeter tube. We've lost two drops of blood. That's it. We're not gonna lose any more blood for this surgery. So this is essentially bloodless surgery and no scar tissue, no damage to the inside of the body because the fibers that we're passing through are spread open and then they come back together when we're done. Any questions? No current questions. All right, let me show you the scope and the laser. This is the scope. It has a light source, irrigation, laser fiber, working channels. This is the actual shaft of the scope and the camera, okay? The suction is on the fluid adapter, which is attached to the tubular endoscopic retractor. Let's show our audience how this surgery actually works. What are we doing in here? We're actually going to the back of the disc that's herniated, and we're gonna use a laser to clean the tear in the back of the disc that you guys saw in the last video. And we're going to remove the fragments of herniation. Now people ask me, are the fragments, you're taking the disc out? And I say, no, we're not taking the disc out. We're not doing a discectomy. We're doing a herniectomy, which means to remove fragments of disc that have moved out of position. So it's not part of the disc. These pieces of herniation, there's a piece right there. These pieces of herniation used to be in as part of the disc, but now they're completely out of place. They've left the disc, the center of the disc where they came from, and they're stuck within the annular tear or they're outside the disc behind it, pushing on nerves. Either way, they're causing the neck pain and the arm symptoms for the patient. So we want to remove these fragments that are causing problems. They are not normal. They are like broken off pieces from the normal disc. Once they break off, you can't put them back. There is no putting fragments back. The core of your disc is called the nucleus propulsus. It's normally one solid piece of tissue, like a little rubber stopper, okay? And then when you get an injury to your your disc with the annular tear, that same inner, inner injury causes a fragmentation of the nuclear material into pieces. And then over time, as you lift and bend and twist, look at all the herniations coming out. You see that? Right there, Henry? Right yes, there? Yes, we do. They're coming out of the epidural space. The reason, look at that, they're jiggling out. The reason they're jiggling out, number one, is I'm using the laser to um, free them up so they can come. But also, number two, the laser releases an energy wave through a pr principle called cavitation, where it literally blasts a hole in the uh, water, the liquid. And it creates, with such force, a, like a jet of water, basically. It's a jet of water <coughs> coming off the tip of that laser. That it actually loosens up herniated fragments. 
and, and lets them come out. Look at that thing. See that herniation that just came out? It's huge. Okay, that's about a three millimeter herniation. Now three millimeters doesn't seem like a lot to most people, but in the wrong place, right up against your, your spinal cord, three millimeters, a bunch of three millimeters is a lot. You know, one three millimeter, not a problem. Two three millimeter, maybe not a problem. But when you get 10 pieces like this right here, notice how it fills the tube. That tube is, uh, is about three millimeters in diameter. And it's kind of sticking to the walls as it comes up and out, right? And I'm floating it out. That's the technique is to float it out. That's the Duke spine technique. We float things out. Taught to me by Pennywise. Any questions, Henry? No current questions. All right, are people able to ask questions? Of course, yeah. All right, good. All right, more pieces coming out. Again, fl we uh, release them and float them out. I don't go in and grab them because grabbing is somewhat of a blind procedure. You don't want to do, um, blind means you can't visually see it happening. You don't want to do a lot of blind procedures in s surgery. So it's better to always visualize what you're doing. Anyway, this is the annular tear. This is where all of his pain has been coming from. And this is just one of two discs that we're fixing today, the 6-7. The blue stuff is the degenerated herniated nucleus propulsus. So what I'm removing right now is not normal disc. It's not the disc. It's not a discectomy. It's a hernia. Oh, look at that big one coming. You guys see it down there? The big blue thing? Oh, yeah. It started to shift and move. We got to release it because it's kind of stuck. It's behind the p fibers of the PLL right there. You see that? I just went through the PLL. There it is. Here it comes. Oh, yeah. That's special right there. Very special. That is what we try to do with open surgery, but we don't really do a very good job of it because you can't see back here. Most surgeons that do ACDFs, spinal fusions in the neck, they cannot see what they're doing. That's why so many patients don't get better because the surgeon, there's another herniation, come on, yes! The surgeon cannot, literally cannot see what they're doing down at the bottom of the hole. And, oh yeah, look at that beast, uh-huh, come on. Yeah, come on out. See how the laser helps it by sending a shock wave? Yep. And it also breaks it up. Almost out. This thing is huge. All right. Luis wants me to go grab it. I'll do that. Let's see how big this thing is. I think it's going to be about four millimeters, just based on how it moves through the tube. Oh, yeah, here we are. Come on. Turn on the light. Light off, please. Thank you. Turn on the light. Let's go. Uh-huh. Can you see this, Henry? Yes, we can. Let's get a little better light. Maybe here. All right. There's the piece right there. You guys see that? Yes, we can. That's, like I said, that's, that's actually five millimeters. Okay. Try to line it up there. Five millimeters. That's a good one. And, and again, this is not the only one. We've taken out already about eight pieces. That's number eight. We got more to go. So the herniation is not one piece, it's many pieces. This is something most people don't know, not even the surgeons know this. They think it's all one piece. They refer to it as the herniation when it's really a mass of pieces, of many pieces, like many marbles in a bag. Remember the days of having marbles? How many of you had one marble in your bag? Nobody had one marble. We all had many marbles, remember? There's a spinal cord down there. I don't know if you guys could see it, but we're pretty damn close to it. This is the neuroforamen, the right side, C67. Questions from our audience? No current questions. So far, this patient's surgery is going quite well. Once again, he's a Florida, a Florida man, 
um, in the good sense that he comes from Florida. That's the nerve root down there, if you can see it, just below where I'm, just to the left of my fiber. We're in the foramen here. And the herniation had pushed the nerve root to the side. You can see the nerve root down there. All right, pretty good. I'm gonna head towards the middle of the disc. You can still see the tear there where the herniations came out of. This is all damaged annulus, a little bit of scar tissue, a little bit of calcification. So far, surgery is going well for this patient. It's odd that we don't have questions, but maybe somebody could make some kind of a comment. We know that the system is working. It'd be nice if somebody on YouTube made a comment, somebody on Facebook made a comment since we're streaming on all those platforms. We do have a comment from Chungo Stevens on oh. YouTube. Wonderful. <laughs> Chungo is one of our top fans and future neurosurgeon. And Thank you, Chungo. <laughs> they said, I was recently diagnosed with brown c -cord syndrome. Should I replace my entire spine with a, me with a mechanical implant? I want to be the Terminator. <laughs> Chungo, Chungo, Chungo. Well, first of all, I'm glad you know who the Terminator is. Arnold Schwarzenegger played the Terminator. Um, but before the Terminator, there was the inspiration for the Terminator, which uh, came from a program called, I think it was the Six Million Dollar Man, wasn't it? Or the Lee Majors. You got to look it up. Six Million Dollar Man. Was it the Five Million, Six Million? I can't remember. That was back in the 70s and 80s. And that was back when Six Million Dollars was actually a lot of money. Um, nowadays, we would just kind of laugh and say, why is he so cheap? But basically, the $6 million man was about a person injured in an accident, horrifically, going to die, and they rebuilt him with technology, like uh, bionic technology, okay? And that was literally the inspiration for the Terminator, which came later, of course, with Arnold. Relevant. Huh? Relevant. Who? Robocop, yeah, of course, Robocop. But all the bionic, uh, cyborg-type human, humanoid characters of the 80s, they all followed the Six Million Dollar Man program. I used to watch it as a kid. Of course, he went around doing good deeds. He was a good guy, like Chungo Stevens. The world needs heroes, really does. So as far as replacing your spine and becoming a, a cyborg, I've heard cyborgs have it good, you know? So it's not a bad idea. But brown saccard syndrome is when half of your spinal cord is damaged uh, through a serious injury to the spinal cord itself. And Unfortunately, with brown saccard, there is no fix. Spinal cord injuries are permanent. And the most common cause for these injuries is trauma. Yeah. For, uh, for example, blunt trauma, and even penetrating trauma, as Dr. Berndez was mentioning. And trauma is, as you know, the number one reason for morbidity and mortality in young people because they just, for some reason, think they're going to live forever and they don't weigh the and assess the risks of their behavior. So it's sad because there's another herniation. We're almost done, um, but trauma is the, the most common reason peop young people, people under the age of 30, uh, end up injured. Whereas, you know, diseases of old people like strokes, heart attacks, Obviously, that doesn't happen so much in younger people. 
It happens in older people. So the disease of young people is trauma, traumatic injuries, which are horrible injuries like brown saccard, which there is no way to fix it. You can do rehab, but it's not going to fix the problem. All right. You can see the posterior longitudinal ligament fibers right there, and I don't see any holes. So that tells me that the herniation in this patient just went out the foramen, mostly on both sides, and we're pretty much done with the foramenal herniation removal. There's not much left. Maybe just clean this up right here, and we should be completely done with C6-7. We'll move on to C5-6. For those of you who are interested in the history of endoscopic cervical spine surgery, the first endoscopic cervical spine surgeries were done over in South Korea. Um, and then in Germany, I was talking to a patient yesterday and she traveled from um, Switzerland to Duke Spine Institute for our Duke laser disc repair. And we were talking about the history of endoscopic surgery. She's traveled all over. And um, I was talking to somebody else as well. And basically, the South Koreans should be credited with the first transdiscal endoscopic surgery. Transdiscal meaning you go through the disc to get to the herniation in the back. But their technique was modified here at Duke Spine and we do it differently. And the difference is using the laser and doing an annular debridement, which they didn't do. They would do a herniectomy only, removing the hernia, but they never debrided the annulus like I'm doing right now. And the annular debridement is unique to the Duke Laser Disc Repair. We're the first to do it, the first to publish it. And that was published back in 2012 We've been performing this annular debridement procedure now for 16 years. Yeah, thanks. And I'm just about done. I don't see any more herniation here centrally. I'm just looking out in the foramen and there's a little bit of herniation right there. You can see the fibers of the posterior ligament. The posterior ligament is very important because that's your limit. That's how far back you can go. Um, once you get to the PLL, just below that's going to be the spinal cord. So you don't want to go through the PLL unless the herniation does. It's very important you determine that during surgery or before if you can. But there's no test before surgery that will tell you if the PLL has been compromised. But you have to visually inspect it as a surgeon. Okay? So the PLL, I'm going to show it to you in a moment, is right there. You see those fibers? You can see it here too. They run left and right, which is up and down. And I don't see any invasion or tear, tear in those fibers over there. Then when you get further to the side, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of that. When you get off to the side here, you go into the foramen. And the neuroforamen, there is no PLL. There is no ligament down there. It's called, there's a foramenal ligament, but there's no posterior longitudinal ligament. So the PLL on the sides become the foramenal ligament. All right, we're done. I don't really see anything more. Looks good. Now, we don't take the tube out just yet because we have another disc to fix, the number 5-6. So I'm going to irrigate with some betadine. It's an antiseptic. Kills any kind of bacteria, protozoans, funguses. It will not kill a prion. Prions, there is no way to, to just kill them or destroy them. A prion is one of the most dangerous microorganisms on earth that we know about today. It causes mad cow disease or uh, originally scrapie, where sheep would scrape their bodies against the fences. Um, and the reason for that was that they were driven mad by this prion, which is a protein that infects you and somehow causes your cells to produce more of it. So it takes over your cells and your brain 
and they manufacture more of the prion and you get it by eating brains of sheep and cow. Anyway, not a concern here today, but uh, very important for doctors in the future to understand there, we don't have a, a way to disinfect or kill the prion. So if you have a patient that you suspect has a prion disease, like Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, you must, uh, if you have to do a brain biopsy on them to confirm the diagnosis, you must dispose of everything that touches brain matter, like burn it in an incinerator. I've had one patient that had Creutzfeldt-Jakob. That was back at Shands Hospital in Gainesville. Shot? All right, and we had to literally burn everything, uh, even the neurosurgeon. I'm just kidding, not that's the neurosurgeon. Not that's not survivable, right? What is? Creutzfeldt-Jakob, Creutzfeldt -Jakob, you're not going to survive. There's no cure. All right, let, you're way overexposed. You can see the dilator down there at 6-7. We're going to move this thing up one disc. I need a little bit of shoulder action in a moment, and we're going to move everything up one level. Just give me a second. So first step is to take out the tube. It's out now, shot. I want to monitor my dilator tip. Why are we not getting the pictures we need here? Okay. Some of it could be the contrast. Shot. There we go. So what it was is there's dye inside this bag, and the bag was basically blocking the view. Shot. So you can see the tip of the dilator. It's in a little bit further I want it to be. Take that off. So I'm going to back it up just a little bit. Shot. All right, good. You, you released the shoulder or something, but now I'm going to move it. So can we all count? Two. Show us, Jordan. Two. It's, it's number two bone. Three, four, five, six. That's our next disc. Show us the target. Yep. So I'm going to come out with my dilator, and then I'm going to move up the spine. You're holding the head neutral. Yep. I'm just about out. Now I'm out right now. I can feel it shot. I'm right on the uh, edge. And I'm going to pop over that bone spur. Right there, I'm out over the bone spur. And I'm in the spine on the ALL, anterior longitudinal ligament. Let's get an AP. Let's make sure we're in the middle. You don't want to deviate off the middle of the spine with the tip. This technique I'm showing you is developed exclusively at Duke Spine Institute. It allows us to treat more than one herniation in the neck, whereas most endoscopic surgeons that do cervical only do one disc at a time. We're going to fix two, we fix three, could even fix four. So I move the tip of the dilator, I slid it along the ALL to the middle. Now I'm going to go back to a lateral view and I'm going to move it up to the next disc, which is number five, six. Shot, and I can feel it sliding. You have to have the feel with your fingers. There it is, so we're right over the next disc. I've got to make sure we're in the middle again, so we'll go to an AP view. You're showing all the views, right, Henry? Of course. The X-ray? Yep. There it is, AP, we're slightly to the right. I'm gonna move my tip a little bit to the left. That should do it. And now we're in the middle. You can see the spinous processes. That confirms we're in the middle. You can actually see some rotation at 5.6, scoliosis. All right, lateral view, perfect. So I'm gonna enter the annulus because I have a dilator so I can go right through it. Yep. As I go into this disc, we're gonna do a discogram and we're gonna find the tear in the back. So now that I'm about the middle of the disc, I'm gonna pipe clean, which means I'm putting this guide wire down. I'm gonna push any disc material out through the tip. Shot. Shot, there it is. All right, so you see I pushed the disc material that got stuck inside the little hollow tip out. Now I'm gonna do my discogram. Shot. All right, one more shot. Show us the tear, big, big tear. There it is, right there in the back of the disc. That's a posterior annular tear. The reason I specify it as posterior because the annulus wraps around the whole disc, front, sides, and back. But it's only the tear in the back 
that causes pain and the herniation, of course, that we care about. Sean? It was actually a serendipitous discovery that this tear in the back of the disc is the cause of all the neck pain and back pain because I was actually trying to do a decompression of the spinal cord and nerve roots, which of course is in the back of the disc. That's where the herniation and tear are. Sean? And as I was doing these decompressive surgeries, getting the pressure off the nerves and spinal cord, my patients would wake up without neck pain or back pain. And that's when I realized the source of neck and back pain was at the back of the disc, not the front or sides. Uh huh. Now we're entering the C5-6 disc with the tube. See the dilators coming back a little bit. Just keep an eye on it. As I slide this tube slowly, deliberately, see the dilator went forward a little there? It's going forward again. That means we may have a cold weld. I'm not gonna let it go much further forward. That's okay. Right about there, you see it's in the herniation shot? Yep, so it stopped. What stopped the dilator tip was the PLL, posterior longitudinal ligament. Very good, so now we're at the back of the disc. Let's pull the dilator back. Just a little bit, shot. All right, perfect. So I'm at the back of the disc and we're ready to do our Duke laser disc repair. Yeah, you can see the tip of that. Um, show us the tip of the tube, Jordan. Stay on the uh, lateral view x-ray, Henry. See the tube? Oh, no. What happened? It's gone. Come on. All right, so stay on the, there's the tip of the tube. Now go down. There's the back of the vertebral body of C6 right there. So you don't want to go any further than that. But look at the other vertebral body above, C5. You see, it's further back. So you might be led to believe, oh, I can go back further on this disc with the two, but you shouldn't because you're already at the limit of the back of the vertebral body. You don't want to go beyond that. You could end up in the spinal cord, which would be a brown saccard syndrome, as Chungo Stevens pointed out earlier. Okay. That Chungo Stevens is pretty smart. You know, I once knew a, a viewer named the Black Chimpanzee who was very, very smart too. All right. There's a herniation. That's beautiful. We're going to go grab it out. Yeah, oh, that's a good one. Let's take a look. We don't get a lot of biggies, but this was a nice big piece. Let's show them. Bring the light on here. I need this light. You guys see this, Henry? Yes, we do. So, wow, that's a good little rock right there. It's definitely over five millimeters. It's about six millimeters. Right, you guys see it? And I just grabbed it and pulled it out with this. This is a hernia, a herniated disc, piece of nucleus that was in the center of the disc and then pushed out through the tear in the back. Got stuck in the tear and basically um, you could see the color change on the edges as it's exposed to inflammation, it turns blue. The blue is an indication that that piece of nuclear material is staining blue with a blue dye that we put in, the Duke spine dye. The dye is actually indigo carmine. Sorry, not indigo carmine. I apologize. It's, uh, yeah, it's indigo carmine. Sorry, it is. And it, it was originally harvested over in India. If you watch the movie Gandhi, you'll see that there were a lot of farmers in India back in the 40s and early part of the, in the 1900s. And they were farming indigo uh, dye crop for the British. The British 
always viewed the, the blue, Europe viewed the blue, the royal blue, as a uh, sign of royalty and nobility. So the demand for blue dyes and blue textiles was very high. And India was considered a very good place for the British Empire to grow these, in, these blue dyes and, and other things, obviously. They would uh, exploit the cheap labor force and resources. Sorry, but I have British friends, but they know it's true. Um, exploitation of those, those people for things like textiles and dyes. During the industrial period. Industrial imperialistic periods of history. We have a couple questions. All right. This first one comes from Keynes25 on YouTube. Well, <laughs> well, we Keynes25 is an absolute regular beast. I love it. Go yeah. for it. They, they ask uh, two part question. Uh, first one asking, did you enjoy your vacation, doctor? And also, have you heard of the term homoborgenesis? Uh, okay, so first of all, I did enjoy my vacation but I long to be back here the whole time. And um, I spent a lot of time on the phone managing business issues, but thank you. I did, I tremendously enjoyed it. Um, went to, for those of you who would like to know, in Mexico there's a hotel called Hotel Escaré, spelled X caret, C-A-R-E-T, X caret, X caret. Anyway, it's in the Yucatan Peninsula, yes, and uh, right on the ocean. And it's an incredible area because they have this, this park, a natural park where you go and you can have, uh, you can go in the jungle basically and you can zip line and drive these monster trucks and just do all kinds of interesting activities outdoors, snorkeling, swimming. So yes, I, I had a wonderful time, and I highly recommend it to anybody that can do it. If you have to save up for it, do so, it's worth it. And then the second thing he asked if I am familiar with the term, and I, and I did not recognize it when you said it. Maybe you could repeat that term. Uh, homoborgenesis, H-O-M-O-B-O-R-G-E-N-E-S-I-S. That's a great question. I've not heard that term, so I am not familiar with it, no. What does it mean and what's the significance? Till then, oh, we have another question. Uh, this comes from Billy54 on YouTube. Hello, Billy54. They ask, Ve Vegas pro hockey player Jack uh, Eichel opted for cervical disc replacement over fusion and is playing again. Would you would your technique have been a better uh, option for him? And would he be playing, uh, would he play again after your tech? Yeah, great question. So you are correct to identify that there's three main treatments for herniated discs in the neck. One is fusion, the other is artificial discs, and the third is endoscopic surgery that you're watching right now. The answer is the best for him would have been this procedure. We would have not put any metal in his neck. We would have just fixed the herniation with the laser naturally. And then the patient would recover and go back to playing hockey normally without a piece of metal in his neck. Now, you may think that the surgery went well, but I can assure you it's only a matter of time before that implant fails and it starts to move or shift or starts to erode through the bone above and below the implant. So I would not recommend the artificial disc. Now had I done a fusion on Mr. Eichel, he would be playing hockey as well. And he'd be playing probably better than he is right now. The fusion patients that I've done have all gone back to being normal and doing normal things. And they do it without any pain or discomfort. Some people do get facet joint pain afterwards and we have to treat the facet joints. 
but this surgery is all natural. There's no metal needed. This is the future of spine surgery and what's happening right now at Duke Spine. This would have been the far better surgery for that player. Unfortunately, he didn't know about it or somebody has some reason for him to do the artificial disc. Maybe they're paying him to do it so they get publicity. I don't know. I don't have an answer for you. But all I know is that if you took 10 hockey players and you put them through 10 fusions, 10 artificial discs, and 10 Duke laser disc repairs, the 10 that have the Duke laser disc repair are going to do better than the 10 in either other group, either of the other groups. And by the way, for those of you who don't know, I am a fusion surgeon as well. I've done a thousand fusions on people's necks and artificial discs, both. I haven't done a thousand artificial discs. I've done probably a hundred, but I've done about 900 uh, fusions. So it's not that I don't do fusions and artificial discs, I do. And you can watch them on our YouTube channel from beginning to end, the entire surgery you can watch. A fusion, I don't know if I have any artificial discs because I stopped doing them <coughs> when I started seeing all the complications. Not my complications, but other surgeons' complications. And um, once you start to see all the, di the artificial disc complications, if you don't believe me, just go onto Facebook or Google it, and you'll see tons and tons of artificial disc complications. Um, unfortunately, once you have a complication, you can't go back and undo it. So the complications from artificial discs are serious and they require usually a fusion to be done as a backup procedure. And so I was seeing a lot of s bad, bad outcomes from artificial discs over the years and I decided this is just not a good surgery. And I started to have, of course, really good outcomes with the fusions with no complications and very high success rate. But at the same time, I was doing the, art, the endoscopic surgery that you're watching now. And the results with the endoscopic surgery are so good that there was no reason to keep going with fusions. You guys see the herniation right there? Look how smooth it is. Look how smooth it is. That was sitting in the foramen right on top of the nerve root. Why is it so smooth? It's smooth because think about how a rock with rough edges goes into a river. And after years, the water and the rumbling and tumbling of the rock smooth it out. Well, that's the same thing that happened to that piece of herniation. Oh, after years of inflammation, uh, scorching its surface, basically, it's gotten smooth. It's like rubbing sandpaper on something rough. See the surface of this disc herniation? That's how the other one started out many years ago. That herniation has probably been there, the smooth one, for about 10 years since his original injury. It just wasn't causing a lot of symptoms for him. It turns out if you have a bunch of small herniations, usually a, a few small ones won't cause much symptoms. The symptoms will go away and then they come back when you re-herniate and get more herniation. All right, more questions. Just about done, five minutes, doctor. Maximum five minutes. Next question comes from Truth Always on YouTube. I love the truth. And they ask, uh, L5 to S1 surgery on April 7th of 2003. Now I have a L4, L5 and L4 disc height is gone and trying to fuse itself. Spinal, spinal stenosis is severe at L4, 5, 4, and 3. Is fusion at L4, 5, and 4 necessary? The answer to that question is no. Absolutely not necessary to have a fusion. Now, if you go to a surgeon who doesn't know how to do the Duke laser disc repair, then maybe a fusion is necessary because there's nothing else for them to do. But if you come to the Duke Spine Institute, we will do the laser surgery. Uh, I got water. Oh, came, it went away. Uh, we could do the laser surgery instead of the fusion and get rid of your pain completely, permanently. So I would not get the fusion done. You don't need it. 
just about done here, about a minute or two. This is the foramen at C56 on the right, sorry, on the left. Um, and you can see the herniation there, which I've gotten most of it. I'm gonna get the rest of it in just a moment. But you can see the anatomy quite nicely uh, with the endoscope. And for those of you wondering, I've kind of pulled the scope back a little bit so you can actually see more of the back of the disc. And what we're seeing down there is the crack between bones. That's the end plate of C5 and that's the end plate of C6. And we're literally between the end plates. And that's where the PLL is. And if you're gonna have a herniation, that's where the herniation is. I'm just peeling a little bit of pieces of herniation off, going out the foramen now, taking any foramenal herniation out. We're almost done. I do wanna get a little more of this foramen. It looks like there's some more pieces in there. Just get rid of all the herniations in there. Gotta be really careful because the um, C6 nerve root sits in there, the left C6 nerve root, which of course goes to the biceps muscle. So if I damage that, uh, he will have a weak biceps for the rest of his life. So you wanna make sure you don't cause any damage to the patient. There's a big herniation there, man. Wow, I gotta get that out, Berndes. I still have this huge thing to get out right here. Okay. Just popped in my view. And it wants to come out. Look at the size of that beast. I'm gonna go get it with the grabber. This could be it. Got it. Trying to wiggle it. I feel it, it's coming. Get the camera on here. Lights, Lastly, quick, lights, lights. Oh yeah, it's, it's got a lot of resistance coming out of this tube. Oh, that's a beast. There it is, bam. Uh, we need the other light, come on. I keep asking for that same light to be turned on. You guys just keep forgetting to turn it on. There it is, okay, pretty good size. You guys see it? Yes, we do. That's a full sonometer long. Look at that thing, full sonometer. Yeah, and I knew it was coming because I could feel it sucking on the wall of the tube as I was pulling it out. It was not wanting to come. It was saying, no, leave me here. I've been such a bad boy. I want to be more bad. Don't take me out of my element. All right, that should hopefully be it. Let's take a look. There may be one more piece, but wow. Laser, please. <laughs> killing me. Oscar's like the disc. He wants to be a bad boy. You want to be spanked, Oscar? <laughs> you sure? <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I'm just about done. So if you have questions at this point, I recommend just typing them up. Let me... Uh, let me come and answer them face to face. I'm just getting these last few pieces right here. Less than one minute left. I think we're done. We're gonna uh, turn on the lights in a moment. And whoa, what was that? A uh, patient is just coming out of muscle relaxer. You see that response? Berndez? Sort of like no, it's okay. You gave him reverse. How long ago did you reverse them? No, it, it's fine. It's just every pulse is causing the muscles to contract. You see that? You feel it, Luis? I feel it, yeah. Yeah. Luis and I feel it. And it's fine. All right, we're done. We're going to irrigate the rest of those. There's no more fragments. He is going to have great results. I expect his neck pain 100% gone. And his arm symptoms gone. We've never had a patient that didn't get rid of their discogenic neck pain or their arm symptoms. It works every time. However, some patients do have facet pain that develops. The pain develops after surgery in about 15% of patients. And we published this in our original publication back in 2013 you go look it up on PubMed, where patients 
uh, 15, I think 15% of the time, they ended up coming back with facet joint pain and we had to treat them with a rhizotomy. Now we have a new form of rhizotomy called the Duke Plasma Rhizotomy. It's the most effective rhizotomy in the world. We've been doing it now for 11 months and we've treated how many patients? 50? And every single one of them, we've gotten rid of their facet joint pain, 100%. The key is making the right diagnosis as to which facet joints are causing pain, and then treating those. We do cervical, we do thoracic, we do lumbar facets. And the traditional way of doing facets is an RFA. Can I have a uh, light on here? The other light, please? Thank you. Can you guys see this? Yes, we can. Here's your incision. You can put this in the uh, video, okay, when we do the testimonial tomorrow. Copy that. That's a beautiful, let's get the uh, ruler. Oh, where's the herniations? Do we have one? All right, there's the, can you see the ruler? Yes, we can. Show me, uh, show me the ones that I grabbed out for you, the biggies. Do you have them? We had the big one, uh, I don't know, we just put it on the. Uh, we may have put it in the pathology. All right, we didn't. We didn't keep the big one. We got rid of it, sent it off to the pathologist. But here's, here's a little one right there. Can you guys see that? Yes, and we can. there's the incision. Thank you. Okay? So that's how it's done, folks. No need for metal. No need for artificial discs anymore. And by the way, those companies, they don't want you to see this surgery because they don't want you getting it. They want you to have metal in your neck. That's how they make their billions of dollars a year in profit. And I'm not exaggerating. Write your questions up and I'm going to come answer them for you. In the meantime, Henry, let's show the uh, viewers one of our patients who had the Duke Laser Disc Repair recently and how they're doing. Copy that. Good morning, I'm Dr. Dumajan. It's December 9th, 2022, and I have with me one of my patients who traveled from out of state, Texas to be exact. Yes, sir. And he is suffering with neck pain, and I'll let him tell you a little bit more about his symptoms, but he had herniated discs in his neck along with degenerated disc. We just repaired those yesterday, less than about 12 hours ago. Yes, sir. Yes, Doc. Yeah. You're here now on post-op day one. It was outpatient no hospitalization, you stayed at the hotel, you're back this morning, and how do you feel? I feel great, Doc. You know, I just want to thank you right off the bat for you and your team for, for basically giving me another lease on, on life. I mean, my hit my the back of my neck, the tops of my shoulders, I had pain all the way down the, the back of my arm uh, and my elbow, and then also I had no grip, and the, today, I, it's all back. I just, you know, it's, it, it's just a game changer, these procedures because I've, I've had fuses in the past, like 15 years ago, and those fusions, you don't, you don't wanna do those because they just give you adjacent disc disease. And that's, I have that problem right now on my back and Dr. Dukes is gonna fix it next week. So I'm very looking forward to, ha to doing that. We'll be seeing him again next week after his back is fixed, but you broke it up into two procedures and we get people all the time asking us, oh, can I come there and get my neck and my back fixed? Yes, you can. We'll probably do it on separate days. Um, so you got three discs repaired yesterday. You can yes, actually see right here in this video footage uh, how small the incision is, tiny. And I was in there endoscopically using a laser to clean out the tear and remove the small herniations. And now here you, we sent you home an hour after your surgery and here you are back today. And, and how much of that pain did we get rid of? All of it, Doc. 100%. I mean, it's 100%. And uh, I mean, he, the doctor did, uh, they, he, they did surgery on three different levels. Mm -hmm. and through a really small hole. Four millimeters. Yes, Four no. millimeters, incredible. <laughs> and it's, mm -hmm. it's, there's no stitches, it's, it's just a Band-Aid. Yeah. You know, that's, that's crazy. Uh, you know, if you have a fusion for three, three level fusion, I don't know how long that would be, but it's Oh, it's, it's about that long yeah. for a three level fusion. And then of course you'll have swallowing trouble for yeah. months. Um, and good. then you'll have pain and You'll be on narcotics. Are you on any opioids or narcotics? No, Doc. Last night I went home and uh, to the hotel, and I just took a Tylenol PM, and that, that's all the medication I've taken since the surgery. Yeah. So with the Duke Laser Disc Repair, you don't have to worry about getting addicted to painkillers because there are no painkillers. Literally a Tylenol, and that's it because it's so minimally invasive. 
far better than ACDF, far better than any other cervical type of surgery. Well, is there anything else you want to tell your fans out there before we wrap this up? Yeah, I just want to let my parents know and my, and my, uh, my 10 year brothers and sisters, if you're watching this, uh, if you have back issues, you need to come see Dr. Duke because he is one of the only people in the world that can do this procedure. And it's, uh, it is a game changer and uh, it's well worth it. At least give him a review. Uh, he'll do a free MRI review for you. There's, I mean, it's just do your research, go to his dukespine.com, look at his website and just do your research and give, your, give yourself a chance to do the right thing. Well, thank you. And yes, now I'm the only one, but someday there will be another one you hope. who will be doing these yeah. surgeries yeah. Uh, and probably better than me. Okay, thanks, Doc. Appreciate thank you, help. sir. Yeah. We'll see you soon. Yeah. Good morning, I'm Dr. R. Duke Majin, CEO and founder of the Duke Spine Institute, here with one of my patients who traveled from Mississippi. Yes, sir, Oxford, Mississippi. Oxford, Mississippi, which I've never been to Oxford, Mississippi, but I'm sure it's a lovely place. Very nice. And why did you come to Duke Spine Institute uh, here in Florida? I'm having issues with my lower back, shooting a pain all the way down towards my elbow, as well as having a little bit of stumbling while I'm walking within my left leg, and went to um, other physicians to look at my spine, whatever, and. They wanted to do fusion and all kinds of other nonsense that I thought. I thought maybe there might be a simpler way, a process of doing things. Did a lot of research and found Dr. Duke here. And what do we do for you? You guys did a C3, I think three, four, four, five, five, six, Perfect. the Duke laser disc repair surgery. And before surgery, you had neck pain? Correct. For how long? It's been ongoing probably for about five years. And then pain going from your neck into your right shoulder down your right arm. Correct. Just getting progressively worse. And that's kind of what made me finally to say, I got to definitely do something about it. Here we are less than 24 hours after your surgery, the Duke laser disc repair. You can see the incision right here. It's four millimeters. And do you still have that neck pain and pain in your arm? No, sir. Zero pain. Gone. Gone. Completely gone. Cured. In, in shock. Results better than I actually anticipated, which, which, is, which is a good thing, right? That's what I'm here for. Well, I'm not shocked. I'm actually, it's what we expect to see typically, which is good. The procedure works and that's why we do it. It works better than anything else. Were you offered any other treatments? Yeah, they wanted me to go look at a, uh, what, what do they call it, a spinal deformity doctor. Uh -huh. And they possibly looked at like doing rods and pins and, yep. and all that kind of good, the fusion and everything. So it just kind of. Why didn't you want to do the fusion option? Long time recovery time mm -hmm. and just more of a, Difficult surgery. Yeah. You know, much more difficult surgery. And, you know, me working at my house, I don't want to, I still want to have good quality of life in the future. Yeah. Well, fusions have complications, a lot of complications. Uh, scar tissue, bleeding, and pain. Are you having any pain right now from the surgery? No, not at all. Just a little stiffness when I turn left to right, but that's par for the course. Yeah, the stiffness is going to take some time to work out. Sure. Um, you've had a bad arthritis in your neck, your di discs were degenerated. You had degenerative disc disease and herniations and bone spur at C3, 4, C4, 5, C5, 6. We went mm -hmm. in and fixed all three. You will need therapy to increase the range of motion. It'll take time and you'll get better. Are you happy with your decision to come to Duke Spine Institute? Very happy. I flew all the way down here from Oxford. <laughs> yeah, very good. So absolutely made the long trip. I fly back Saturday. And I feel much better flying on the plane than I did earlier. Just thinking, you know, I'm not on any kind of pain medication, none of the muscle relaxant. There's zero pain. So I feel yeah. more comfortable hopping on that plane. And we did it all through a four millimeter incision. You could actually see the incision with the little tube going in to your discs. I moved the tube from one disc to the next. And we went back to the back of the disc where the tear was and I cleaned the tears up with the laser. So I'm that, that usually does the trick of getting rid of the neck pain when it comes from okay. a herniated disc. And of course, we unpinched the nerve roots that were going down your arm. So that's why your arm is feeling better as well. I don't expect any of that to come back. You, okay, should, great. you should be pain free the rest of your life. Just don't re injure the discs. Absolutely. I'm definitely glad to get my quality of life back. That's the number one thing. Anything you want to tell your audience? Anybody that's dealing with the same issues I have, I definitely come recommend to come to the Duke Institute of you know, Laser Surgery. It's a wonderful thing. All right. Well, congratulations. Thank you Safe so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, you so dad. much. We will. Yeah. Well, my dad lives in, he lives in Tampa, so 
So my wife's up there in Oxford taking care of her stuff up there. So okay, worked out good to have my dad here to pick me up and drop me off at the airport tomorrow. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Well, safe travels for you then. Thank you so much. I sure appreciate it. My pleasure. And welcome to our broadcast. We're just finishing up surgery on a patient who traveled here from Tampa, Florida with two herniated discs in his neck. And when you look at the MRI scan, it doesn't look that bad. We call them bulging discs, which are still herniations. Um, and the basis of his pain is there's a tear in the wall of the disc. We call that wall the annulus fibrosis. And the annulus fibrosis is a, a very tough membrane that wraps around the disc circumferentially. It's about 20 layers of collagen and it holds a hydraulic jelly in the middle. It's not really a liquid, uh, but it's a firm substance. And the problem is that when we get into accidents like this patient had 10 years ago, your bones suddenly move and they compress the disc or tear the disc. And what they're tearing is they're tearing the annular fibers and they make what's called an annular tear. And then of course they crush the disc behind the tear and they cause the disc to fragment into little pieces. So when you get a tear, not that big of a deal, it can heal itself. But if you go to doing normal stuff right afterwards, you're lifting and carrying, you're putting pressure on your bones, they're squeezing your disc, they're pushing pieces of the disc, fragments, the fragments of the disc, they're pushing them out into the tear. And so that's when you start getting the pain and the symptoms of a herniated disc. Duke Spine Institute is the first in the world to describe this. We're the ones who figured it out years ago, 16 years ago to be exact. And <clears throat> since then, I went and trained with a Koreans and German surgeon named Sebastian Royden. And I learned how to approach the disc and use a small tube to go through the normal part of the disc to the back where the herniations are, where the tear is, and to use the laser and grabbers to remove those pieces and clean the tear and, called, and a procedure called annular debridement. That is the only uh, main part of the surgery, the Duke laser disc repair that we do. We don't do a discectomy. A discectomy is when you remove the entire disc, which there's no reason to take the disc out in these patients. The disc is normal. Um, it's just the back part, the size of a pea or two little peas in the back, they really need attention and help. All right, do we have any questions? Yes, we, uh, a, no current questions, so we do have a comment from Liz Lindsay on Facebook. All right. And they said, good morning. It has been a week since uh, Jimmy had his DLDR at L5 to S1 and is doing great. Thank you, Dr. Duke, and your incredible staff. You guys are the best. Well, Ms. Lindsay, uh, thank you so much for acknowledging our hard work to make people happy and pain-free at Duke Spine. And we also thank you for trusting us with your husband and his care for his herniated disc in his back. We're glad to hear you guys are doing fantastic. I've been following your journey back from Florida to Texas, and I'm praying for you and your husband that you guys um, have a safe and enjoyable time and um, I'm praying for you especially that God blesses you and continues to bless you and your family and friends. So it's wonderful to hear from you guys at Duke Spine Institute. We appreciate it. Um, I just want to say before we wrap this up that the surgery for this gentleman went very well and we didn't have any complications. If you watch the whole surgery you'll see there's no bleeding this is a bloodless surgery, folks. And another great thing about this surgery is compared to the fusion surgeries where surgeons are going and putting a metal plate in your neck bolted to your spine, or worse, artificial disc surgery where they're putting uh, these metal discs in your spine, which you can kind of see a disc right there that's been replaced. These surgeries are highly invasive and totally unnecessary 98% of the time. If you've been recommended or know somebody recommended for an artificial disc called a total disc replacement or even a fusion, send them to Duke Spine. See if they're a candidate for the laser surgery. 
I can tell you right now, just all comers, 98% of the people recommended for fusion and artificial discs do not need it. It's unnecessary. They can be fixed completely with the Duke Laser Disc Repair. It's less expensive surgery and it's safer. There's no post-operative narcotic painkillers. So you're safe. You don't have to worry about overdosing, becoming addicted or abuse of opioid narcotics. It's been in the news. They're horribly addicting drugs and everybody that gets a fusion, everybody that gets an artificial disc is put on those narcotics. So you do not need narcotics after the Duke Laser Disc Repair. Um, uh, our patients are safe and they have a wonderful procedure and they do fantastic. Any other questions? That is it. All right, we will be back in about uh, maybe an hour and we have a patient who travels from Texas actually, who is here with her husband, and she had a fusion done in her back. Her back was fused at L4-5 and L5-S1, and now she has adjacent segment disease. Folks, don't get a fusion. It creates more problems above and below for your spine. So now she has two herniations on the right side above her fusion, we're going to go in with the laser and remove the herniations and clean up the tear. Um, and that's going to fix her right leg symptoms and her back pain. We do have one question just came up. This comes from Casa on YouTube. Hello, Casa. Thanks for asking a question. And they ask, will you be able to review a CT scan post-op ACDF C6 through 7 fusion for opinion on treatment of continued pain? Yes, Cass, I'm happy to do a review of your CAT scan post ACDF for ongoing pain. I can tell you right now, I will figure out exactly where your pain is coming from and we can cure it very easily with either the laser surgery you just watched now or a combination of the laser surgery and a Duke plasma rhizotomy. The point is your pain is either coming from a disc above your fusion or the facet joints either above or below your fusion. And just so you understand what the facet joints are, the facet joints are, there's two types of joints in the spine. You have the disc, which is a joint here in the front, and you have facet joints in the back, okay? Most people with a fusion end up getting facet joint pain. It's either in the back left or the back right, and facet joint pain is worse, made worse when you twist your head side to side. So if you're having left-sided facet joint pain, you would turn your head to the left and you'd feel a sharp pinch. If you're having right-sided facet joint pain, you would twist your head to the right and you would have a pinch on the right. So I can diagnose where your pain's coming from quite easily and we can fix it even easier. But you'll have to come to Duke Spine for the fix. I'm gonna have Henry post our free MRI review. Obviously you don't have an MRI, you have a CAT scan upload it, I'll be happy to look at it, okay? If we need an MRI, we'll tell you and we'll order it. And we can do that virtually. Nice to meet you, thanks for asking. Here comes the link for the Duke Spine Institute, free MRI slash CT review, and a free consultation virtually with me. You'll meet me and I'll figure out what's wrong. Have a nice day, we'll be back in about 30, 40 minutes for our lumbar Duke laser disc repair, which is gonna happen next. And again, just like Cassie, it happened uh, next to the fusion that she already had, which we didn't do the fusion, by the way. Somebody else did. 